Just how many cold cadavers will we collect in the Terminator? It's time to bag them and tag them. Leave anything for us? A good supply of body bags. Body bags. And welcome to the Movie Morgue. My name's Josh, your movie examiner, and today I'll be taking a look at The Terminator from 1984, directed by James Cameron. The Terminator and Terminator 2, like most people my age, is ingrained in every fiber of my being. These movies were in constant rotation in my house as a kid. The Terminator was a small idea that did big things for everyone involved. It was impossible to anticipate. It was a lot larger than life. I went, oh my God, this guy's awesome. This is gonna be a great movie. Nobody has ever seen this before. That Terminator is out there. So all hell's gonna break loose. And it absolutely will not stop. Ever. Until you are dead. Get out. The story was conceived after Cameron had a fever dream in which he saw a metal skeleton crawling towards him with a knife. Uh, a knife-wielding robot cut in half, crawling over the ground after some you know, poor female victim. And that was sort of the nucleus for the story. He contacted a fellow producer, Gail Ann Hurd. We came through the Roger Corman school together. We worked on Battle Beyond the Stars together. We knew each other pretty well, so she was a natural choice. We decided that we would collaborate on the film and bring it to the screen. Heard is a legend in her own right, producing many successful films and television shows. This was the breakout role for Arnold Schwarzenegger, who had recently garnered attention with his role as Conan the Barbarian. He became an actor after having a professional bodybuilding career for 15 years and is a seven-time Mr. Olympia winner. He originally read for the role of Kyle Reese, but felt more of a connection to the titular machine. And as it turns out, Arnold didn't want to play Reese at all. Arnold had read the script and said, well, I want to play this Terminator guy. I got fascinated by the Terminator. The bad guy. The bad guy. Right. To which James Cameron agreed. I was thinking, you'd make a great Terminator. And the rest is history. He was just happy he didn't have to walk around with his shirt off through the entire movie. You're close. Give them to me, now. I did take it off just for a few minutes, but the rest of the movie was with close. Schwarzenegger gives a cold and emotionless performance here, with very little dialogue, making him more of a Michael Myers as opposed to a Rambo or Chuck Norris, pushing the Terminator more into slasher territory than an action spectacle. It was an ambitious movie for Cameron. So I'll do it myself, I'll do everything myself. I mean, he wants to do basically everything because he has so, such a clear vision. He wanted it his way, he wanted to get what he wanted, he wanted his vision up there. And he... His vision would require massive makeup effects work and the late Stan Winston was brought in to bring the Terminator to life, along with some great miniature work by Fantasy II VFX. This team of visionaries, along with a strong work ethic, enabled Cameron to bring us one of the best sci-fi thrillers of all time. It's not only a good action movie, but it's an important action movie. The story follows a cyborg from the future that is sent back to 1984, tasked with eliminating Sarah Connor before she can give birth to a human resistance leader. His name is Connor, John Connor. Who will bring victory in the war against an artificial intelligence known as Skynet. Bodies pile up on the streets of Los Angeles as the killing machine systematically searches for his target. Sarah Connor? Yes? While Kyle Reese, a soldier in the resistance in the future, is sent back to protect her at all costs. You've been targeted for termination. Sarah is thrown into a horrific spin on the Bachelorette with one suitor looking to capture her heart, the other hell-bent on ripping it from her chest. Screw you, we got her throat! Let's pull her fucking heart out! So how many bodies do you think we collected in the Terminator? Let me know in the comments below. Until then, let's open some body bags. We open up the movie in the year 2029, revealing a dystopian Los Angeles, looking a lot like LV-426, where hunter killers, or HKs for short, patrol the air, while tank-like HKs patrol the Skull Highway in search of humans. As they pass by, text appears on screen stating that, the machines rose from the ashes of a nuclear fire to exterminate mankind in a war that has raged for decades. But the final battle will be fought here in our present. Real quick, I'm not gonna be counting any skulls or skeletons unless they signify a character or a body that is integral to the plot. So don't expect any skeletons to be counted here. Also, 
I'm no medical professional, so don't take anything I say seriously, okay? We then get one of the best title sequences ever put on film, where we see the slow reveal of our metallic title over Brad Fidel's iconic score. It was the idea of this mechanical man, in a sense, and his heartbeat. Fidel had scored TV movies before this, but would go on to provide the music for Terminator 2 along with both Fright Night films, Gladiator, and True Lies. In 1984, it's Carpet Day at the Griffith Observatory, where a lightning storm brings Thor, son of Odin. Just kidding, it's the Terminator. He's the strong silent type and loves looking out at the LA skyline while taking long walks in the nude. This trio of punks spot a constellation. Hey man, I think that's the Big Dipper. Nice night for a walk, eh? He also enjoys doing the nasty. Nothing clean, right? Nothing clean, right? He demands their clothes before the mood switches. Fuck you, asshole. And he makes easy work of the punks, breaking Spike's neck and giving Mr. Stabby here a lift into a body bag after he pulls his arm out of his torso. He falls dead and we call time of death six minutes into the movie. And with that, it's time to send out the meat wagon. Our first two toe tags go to Bill Paxton and Brian Thompson. This being Thompson's first film, he'd go on to be in movies like Cobra, Fright Night 2, Three Amigos, and Mortal Kombat Annihilation. It has begun! Spike here is played by Bill Paxton in one of his earliest roles. Paxton had quite an acting career, winning a Saturn Award for his performance in Aliens. That's just fucking great, man! A SAG Award for Apollo 13, and was nominated for an Emmy for his work in HBO's Big Love. I believe in the covenant of plural marriage. He's also amazing in Near Dark, Predator 2, Twister, and the underrated horror film Frailty, which he also directed. He'd share the screen with Arnold again in 1994's True Lies. Pussy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and is the only actor to have ever been killed on screen by an alien, a predator, and a Terminator. Even though I'm not so sure this would have killed him here, I'm no doctor, so in honor of the late great Mr. Paxton, I'm awarding him this show's first official toe tag. We miss you, Bill. Here's your tag. Game over, man. Game over. Now, the third punk here, I am not going to count because we don't see him die and there's no confirmation that he was killed. Therefore, no toe tag for you, punk number three. Elsewhere in an alleyway, a homeless man witnesses the arrival of Odin himself. <laughs> Damn it, no, it's just Kyle Reese, a soldier from the future who's scarred physically and mentally, suffers from PTSD, and is a big fan of Mugatu's fashion line. Derelict! So he takes this homeless man's pants, but is spotted by the fashion police, so he darts away before they can give him a citation. They're so Reese is played by Michael Bean, an actor best known for this and Aliens as Corporal Hicks. He'd work with Cameron again in The Abyss and can be seen in films like Tombstone, Planet Terror, and the completely bonkers Deadfall with Nick Cage. Fucking fuckers fucked! A police officer pursues the male model and Reese manages to disarm him and ask, What day is it? Guess he's got a hot date tonight. He then breaks into a department store to evade more police. And I love how we see Reese's survival instincts kick in here. He adds some pieces to his wardrobe, like these Nike vandals. I'm sure they'll come in handy for all the running he's gonna be doing. Come on, man, you couldn't have grabbed some new pants while you were in there? He escapes the store, steals a shotgun from a police car, then runs out into the city, trying not to bring attention to himself. I love these guys in the background that step back as he comes out. He enters a phone booth and combs the directory for the name Sarah Connor, tears out the page, and runs away. Enter Bachelorette Sarah Connor, a 20-something waitress having a really shitty day at work, spilling coffee on customers, and getting a pocket full of rainbow sherbet. Look at this way, in a hundred years, who's gonna care? Sarah's played by Linda Hamilton, who was stalked earlier that year in Children of the Corn. Yeah, yeah. And little does she know, tonight she's got a hot date with an Outlander. The T-800 gives us a look at his new wardrobe before carjacking the Griswold family truckster and hitting up a guns and ammo store. The clerk is played by the infamous character actor Dick Miller, who's appeared in over 64 movies, including Inner Space, 
Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight, Chopping Mall, and Dead Meat, and is probably best known for his role in Gremlins. He shows the metalhead an arsenal of firearms, like the new 45 long slide with laser sighting. Put the red dot where you want the bullet to go. You can't miss. Wherever the red dot goes, you bang. And the Terminator says he'll take one, one of each. each. The clerk tells him there's a 45 day waiting period for the weapons, but he's gonna take them now. You can't do that. Wrong. And we add Dick Miller to the pile of body bags. Since this is 1984 BG, the Terminator has no choice but to go through the phone book, visiting Sarah's one by one. Sarah Connor? Yes. He dispatches Sarah Louise Connor with a bullet to the head and fires five more rounds into her torso. She should have been listening to the Terminator alarm that was going off on the lawn. The machine's rampage is top story as Sarah's co worker shows her on the news. You're dead, honey. Yeah, it's time to catch up with Reese. He's hot wiring a car, then drifts into a dream of the world from which he came. We see him and another soldier have a firefight with the machines. Reese throws a grenade and destroys the tanker HK, but this resistance fighter gets blown to bits in the process. He makes a break for it as another pursues from the sky, but the aircraft catches up and fires on the car, causing it to flip, and I'll go ahead and call the time of death for the gunman on the roof at the 19 minute mark. As the car goes up in flames, Reese screams his way out of his PTSD dream, comes back to 1984, and drives off looking for love. Sarah and her roommate Ginger are getting ready for a night out when Sarah picks up a sexy phone call. First, I'm gonna rip the buttons off your blouse one by one. Whoa, 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 slow it down there, Slider. Make sure you got the right person on the phone before you start getting all kinky, flyboy. Who is this? It's just Ginger's pervy boyfriend, Matt. He's played by Rick Rosovich, Iceman's radar intercept officer, and Tony Scott's Top Gun. I guess you guys are lucky and famous, huh? No, you mean notorious. Sarah's date stands her up, literally dodging a bullet or six, so she's taking herself out for pizza and a movie, passing up a threesome with Matt and Ginger on the way out. They decide to have a threesome with a Walkman instead. The nightly news reports on the death of a second Sarah Connor, and this spooks our Sarah. She then notices a secret admirer following her around and ducks into the cleverly named nightclub Tech Noir. We called it Tech Noir because you know, the kind of filmmaking that we were doing, that it was, as opposed to film noir, Tech Noir, the dark side of technology. The club's name inspired the song Tech Noir by the band Gunship, with a cameo from the horror legend John Carpenter. Come. Meanwhile, the police have noticed a pattern in today's murders, confirming that Sarah Ann Connor was shot six times in her home, and the shootings have all occurred in the same order as in the phone book. You're kidding me. Lieutenant Traxler here is played by Paul Winfield. You may know him from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and Volkovich is played by Lance Henriksen. He's the third actor here that would go on to be in Aliens with Bean and Paxton. Fun fact, Henriksen was the original choice to play the Terminator. Jim Cameron had worked with Lance Henriksen on Piranha 2, and he very much wanted Lance to play the Terminator. He saw the Terminator initially as someone who would really blend in. The Terminator I always saw as this kind of cipher, this kind of anonymous guy. He even drew up concept art with the actor's likeness. I actually did a painting of Lance in the character, you know, with the leather jacket and the gun and the kind of the one red eye and the whole thing. Henriksen was really into the role, so much so that he showed up to a meeting with Cameron in character as the Terminator. And Lance walks in as the Terminator, and he just kept sitting there, not moving the entire time or doing, you know, and he had everybody in that office scared to death. They've been trying to reach out to Sarah, but keep getting her machine. The dynamic between the two officers is great as you watch them ribbit one another like an old married couple. How do I look? Like shit, boss. Yo, mama. Traxler goes to the press with the information, hoping it will get our bachelorette's attention, which it does. She calls from the club and Traxler tells her to sit tight and stay visible until they arrive. The Terminator's now made it to Sarah's apartment. Ginger makes some after sex munchies while Matt gets a rude awakening. Whoa! The cyborg tosses Matt through a glass door while an oblivious ginger rocks out with her headphones on. That's seven years bad luck, Matt. 
She gets a surprise when her boy toy crashes through the bedroom door, battered and bloody. Get him a body bag! Sorry, Flyboy. Guess that threesome with Sarah is never gonna happen now. The Terminator zeroes in on Ginger and shoots her in the back. The scene of Ginger crawling away while the machine walks slowly after her is so bleak and disturbing because you know this girl has no chance of making it out of this alive. He fires five more shots into Ginger's back, making her our ninth body to go in a bag 31 minutes into the movie. And how convenient of Sarah to call right now and leave a message with her location. She's eagerly awaiting the police while Tech Noir starts hopping. But the real party begins when the Terminator gets there in record time. It's only by coincidence that she avoids being seen on his first pass through the club. Then she notices her secret admirer at the bar as the Terminator approaches. For me, the fun in that scene was the buildup, the, the, the latent tension of what is going to happen, knowing that one guy's armed, the other guy's armed. They're lurking around through the crowd, so all hell's going to break loose. Then Reese blasts him with a shotgun, knocking him off of his feet. The T-800 pulls out an Uzi and opens fire, killing a club patron as Reese jumps behind the bar. The Terminator sees Sarah running for the door and shoots two more patrons, knocking one into Sarah to pin her down. As 800 reloads, Reese hits him with five more shots, blasting him out the front window, long enough for Reese to give Sarah his best pickup line. Come with me if you want to live. And she joins Reese on what will become the worst first date she could ever imagine. This scene is the only time Schwarzenegger and Michael Bean were on set together. That was the only time we were ever on frame together. I mean, we were always running away from him. If he had caught up with us and I was doing a scene with him, we would have had no movie. And oddly enough, the two really didn't interact behind the scenes. Now, I saw him around. He was doing his thing and I was doing my thing. We never worked together. No. By the time I got into the same frame as the Terminator, he was no longer Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was a special effect and he was Stan Winston's wizardry. We get to see things from the Terminator's point of view as he chases after them. Reese causes an explosion, but the machine launches over the wall of flames onto the hood of the car with no eyebrows and punches through the windshield, reaching for Sarah. He's thrown from the hood as they back out of the alleyway and a police car pulls up and calls for backup. The police officer here is actually a cameo from the film's screenwriter, William Wisher Jr. The Terminator leaves him with a splitting headache before taking his cruiser and driving away. Reese speeds away with Sarah and tells her who he is and why he's here while being chased by police. I'm here to help you. The Terminator mimics the voice of the police officer like he's Ghostface in Scream 3 while he searches for Sarah. This is 1L19. We get a marvelously crafted exposition dump from Reese as he tells Sarah about the Terminator. He's not a man. Machine. Complete with all the best human features. Sweat bad breath, everything. But Sarah's not stupid. She knows they can't make things like that yet. Not yet. Not for about 40 years. So what you're really trying to say is... I'm from the future. Right. She's just gonna shake it off, but Reese assures her that the machine can't stop, won't stop moving. Until you are dead. And isn't really sure if the primitive weapons in this time will stop the killing machine. They get some new wheels and hide out long enough for Sarah to get some more intel. Like, why the hell does it want her? Reese tells Sarah that an artificial intelligence got a bit too smart and decided humans were useless meat bags and started a nuclear war, explaining that some were kept alive in detention camps to load bodies for disposal, and he shows her his barcode. Hey, I've got one of those too. But there was one man who taught them to rage against the machines, and his name was Connor, John Connor. Before Sarah has time to process this information, the Terminator locates them in a high-speed chase ensues through the streets of Los Angeles. With a gunshot here and a gunshot there, here a shot, there a shot, everywhere a gunshot. Reese lands a lucky shot to the Terminator's face, causing him to crash into a wall as the police close in. And Sarah saves Reese from a ride in the meat wagon. They'll kill you. They're taken into custody and the Terminator vanishes. Like a virgin on prom night. I mean, they vanish. At the police station, Lieutenant Traxler tells Sarah that unfortunately Matt and Ginger have gotten their toe tags and introduces her to the despicable Dr. Silberman. She asks if Reese is crazy, to which he replies, That's what we're gonna find out. The Battle Damaged Terminator enters a hotel room, and we witness the great special effects work of Stan Winston on display. In a scene where the cyborg repairs its damaged hand, it's a gruesome scene, but mesmerizing to watch, as the machine slices its forearm open to reveal its chrome bones. 
Meanwhile, Reese tells Silberman about his time travel adventure and Traxler and Volkovich observe. Michael Bean really shows off his acting chops here and tells them this was a one-way trip on the time travel express. Nobody goes home. We check on the peeping Tom techie with X-ray eyes. Things are going great and they're only getting better. He's doing all right with his X-Acto blade and he's got a pupil so bright he's got to wear shades. And we made a huge oversized uh, endo eye area that we use for close-ups for the eye operation and also allowed us to show the eye irising uh, using a actually a camera lens. He locks and loads and then heads to the police station. We watch footage of where Reese left off in his interview, and he tells us more about the future, while Silberman takes a pause to admire the intricacy of Reese's story. If I could make a career out of this guy. Kyle becomes unhinged, and why Sarah is watching this footage, I have no idea. Her her fucking heart out. But at least Traxler shuts it down. Sarah asks Silberman for his diagnosis, and he gives her the technical terminology. He's a loon. Traxler and Volkovich mansplain to Sarah how the attacker could have withstood gunshots and punched through a windshield. <sighs> That's easy. Body armor and drugs. The lieutenant tells Sarah to get some sleep while she waits for her mom and informs her she's perfectly safe. For about 10 minutes, maybe. The Terminator enters the police station asking to see Sarah, but is told to wait. Just ask Dick Miller what happened when he told the Terminator he had to wait. So he says, I'll be back. Schwarzenegger initially did not want to say this line. It doesn't really matter what line it is. It's all because I say every goddamn line wrong. I had different quarters with I'll be back. I'll, I'll, what is this with the tongue? I said, this sounds kind of weird. It's not strong enough. I say, I want to say, I will be back. And he says, what does the goddamn script say? And as it says, I'll be back, he says, that's say, I'll be back, God damn it. But he had no problem saying it in a bunch of movies after this one. I'll be back. 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 Ha! You did not gonna say that, did you? That's what you always say. I'll be back. You've been back enough. I'll be back. The officer goes back to his paperwork, but is blinded by the light. As a car drives through the station, crushing him to death. And he'll be the first of many body bags we're going to count in our first ever Murder Montage. The Terminator kills seven officers as he makes his way through the station, shooting this guy in the ass and then killing the lights. But they won't go on the count. That's enough distraction for Reese to get himself out of his handcuffs. Traxler and the other officers arm themselves while Sarah takes cover under a desk as the carnage continues. The machine mows down three more boys in blue here, and we see two dead on the floor in the hallway as he walks by. One officer manages to land a shot to the machine's chest before getting bagged, and Traxler takes a shot at him before he's terminated. Volkovich attempts to avenge his work wife, but eats bullets for his effort. Reese finds Sarah, and we can see a body on a desk behind them as they make their way out of the precinct, steal another car, and speed away as the Terminator runs out of ammo. That gives us a grand total of 17 dead police officers in the murder montage. Including Lieutenant Traxler and Volkovich. I'll order up some body bags. Reese and Sarah ditch their car and hide out under an overpass for the night. Kyle tells Sarah he volunteered at the chance to meet the legend Sarah Connor, but she's not convinced he has the right person. I didn't ask for this honor and I don't want it! Any of it! I'd rather just sing. Stop that. You're not going into a song while I'm here. Kyle gives her a message from John relaying that the future is not set. You must be stronger than you imagine you can be. You must survive or I will never exist. He then puts her to sleep with a bedtime story, a day in the life of a resistance fighter. We time travel to 2029 and follow Kyle making his way through the ruins of Los Angeles into a base below ground. He looks around at the hopeless, desolate state of this world as survivors scavenge rats for dinner and fire up the TV for some entertainment. Kyle takes a load off and reveals a picture of Sarah, but before he can rub one out, a Terminator infiltrates the base and starts shooting people and dogs. Okay, now I'm no vet and I don't like tagging animals, but I'm gonna tag the dogs because dogs are great and they deserve to be recognized. I just need you to know that when I do it, I'm not fucking happy about it. 
Kyle fires at the machine, but an explosion knocks him to the ground. He watches his picture of Sarah melt as we fade back into 1984. I estimate 11 more dead bodies here in this flashback and two dogs that the Terminator killed. They hitch a ride into town and check into a motel. Reese gives Sarah a revolver and goes out for supplies and wouldn't you know, there is a supplies store right down the street. The Terminator is scanning through Sarah's address book that he took from her apartment when a janitor smells something funky and knocks on the door. Got a dead cat in there or what? And the Terminator borrows one of Bill Paxton's lines from earlier. Fuck you, asshole. He heads off to work, and the guy in the hall cracks me up every time I watch this scene. Damn! Sarah showers and calls her mom to let her know she's okay, but to no one's surprise... That's not your mother, it's a man, baby! The Terminator has already executed Mrs. Connor off screen and was waiting for Sarah's phone call. <laughs> Kyle returns with supplies and they spend the night making pipe bombs before Kyle tells Sarah that he's been crushing on her ever since John gave him a picture of her in the future. She gives him a little kiss and they spend the rest of the evening making a future resistance leader, if you know what I mean. Post coitus, we get a playful moment between Kyle and Sarah before a Terminator alarm goes off. <laughs> Cyborg tries to surprise the happy new couple, but they're already headed for their honeymoon. They steal a truck and speed off while the Terminator gives chase. They litter the streets of LA with gunfire and pipe bombs until Kyle takes a bullet. Sarah swerves into the Tin Man, resulting in a rollover. Hey, watch out for that! Tanker. The truck driver stops to check things out and is given a toe tag for his trouble. The Terminator takes the wheel and tells the passenger his favorite Jordan Peele movie. Get out but his is nope. Nope. Mm -mm. nope. nope. Sarah drags Kyle out of the wreckage before the Terminator tears through the pickup truck after them. Kyle tosses a pipe bomb into the tanker and Sarah's nearly roadkill when the tanker explodes. This explosion was achieved with miniatures. Cameron wanted to blow up a real truck for the shot, but he couldn't because where he was shooting it in downtown Los Angeles was in front of the police armory meaning that they had the all the guns and the ammunition and the police helicopters up on the roof of this building. Sarah watches the T-800 roast, then hears Kyle calling for her. They embrace, but before they can live happily ever after, the cyborg's endoskeleton rises from the flames. Stan Winston's work here is amazing, and as menacing as Schwarzenegger is, the endoskeleton is truly terrifying. The concept of creating a full-size endo, I had literally had to talk Jim into. He planned on most of all of the, uh, the endoskeleton work being done in stop-motion animation. I mean, look at this thing! It's friggin' scary! Sarah and Reese break into a nearby building. The machine limps after them down a long corridor. They barricade the door and that manages to slow the machine down for a moment. Kyle collapses, but Sarah orders the soldier to his feet, dragging him into the factory as the Terminator says, ready or not, here I come. They come to a proverbial dead end as the murder skeleton corners them. Kyle has batting practice with the Terminator's head, but the robot strikes him out before he hits a home run. You're out. Kyle lights the last pipe bomb and shoves it into the machine's midsection, then cartwheels down the stairs as the Terminator is blown to pieces. Sarah pulls a piece of shrapnel out of her leg and crawls over to Kyle, only to see that he has succumbed to his injuries. And he gets a toe tag 96 minutes into the movie. Sarah barely has a moment to mourn her baby daddy when the chrome skeleton comes to life and says, Peekaboo! <laughs> And one of the best jump scares in movie history. Cameron then brings his nightmare to life as Sarah crawls through the factory with the top half of the machine on her heels. She reaches a hydraulic press and lures the machine in. She pulls a grate down to trap it, but it reaches out for a high five and she leaves him hanging. You're a terminated fucker. Turning the killing machine into a metal pancake as its red eye fades to black. Paramedics arrive and Sarah watches as they zip Kyle into a body bag. Putting an end to the worst first date ever. Months later, we join Sarah as she's driving down a long desert highway. Cool she's very pregnant with a Terminator alarm in the back seat and a gun in her lap. She's making therapy tapes for her future war hero and is brushing up on her Spanish. Gasolina, por favor. Conflicted on whether or not to tell John who his father is and what kind of a mindfuck it's going to be for him. 
God, a person could go crazy thinking about this. She proclaims her love for Kyle as a boy snaps a Polaroid of her. And we see it's the picture that John will eventually give Kyle in the future. The Nino warns Sarah that a storm is coming in. She says, I know, as she drives her Jeep into a matte painting of the dark, inevitable future. But how many people and dogs did the Terminator terminate? Let's get out the blackboard and break it down. I have a total of 43 dead bodies in the Terminator. I was only able to positively identify eight of the victims, which left us with 35 John slash Jane Doe's. We did have two dogs we had to put into the pet cemetery because Terminators are dicks to dogs. And with a runtime of 107 minutes, that means we sent out the meat wagon every 2.5 minutes. I have to award Ginger the best cause of death in the movie. While it's not the bloodiest death, it's definitely the scariest death in the movie. Poor Ginger. And I'll have to give an honorable mention to Brian Thompson's punk number two. It's a gruesome death right at the beginning of the movie that really sets the tone for how deadly the Terminator is. And that wraps up my exam of the Terminator. It opened number one at the box office and held on to that spot for another week. And maintain the same box office weekend and week out for a number of weeks. With one critic calling it a B-movie with flair. You never really know how a movie's gonna do until it gets in front of an audience. You never know how it's gonna do. But with a total box office of over $78 million, it became one of the highest grossing movies of 1984. Cameron's vision of a killer cyborg from the future hit a chord with audiences worldwide. Part of it was timing, part of it was that we really did deliver a good film and a film that at the time became part of the whole zeitgeist of America in 1984. Sending Arnold Schwarzenegger into stardom. After that came Commando and Red Heat and a Predator and True Lies and all of those kind of things. The rest, of course, is history. And the titular character currently ranks at number 22 on AFI's 100 Greatest Movie Villains of All Time. James Cameron would follow it up with one of the best sequels ever made in 1991. It was inevitable that a Terminator sequel would get made, and I wanted to be at the helm. After a long legal battle over the rights. The rights were in complete chaos. But Carol Coe Pictures would come to the rescue and get the ball rolling. I would like to check now. In the meantime, Cameron directed Aliens, another great sequel, and The Abyss, pushing the envelope even further in the visual and special effects department. The Terminator would become a franchise that would spawn five sequels, a TV show, video games, action figures, and become a pop culture phenomenon. I'll be back next time to examine Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Until then, thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing. And make sure you hit that notification bell so you can join us next time we fill out the toe tags in cinema's body bags. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy being alive. You can click the top link to go to Terminator 2. You can click the bottom link to check out my podcast, The VHS Files where we talk about all the movies from the video store era, the stuff we missed, the stuff we love, and the stuff we loathe. If you made it to the end of the video, I want to say thank you so much for checking it out. I hope you'll come back for the rest of the Terminator series. They're going to be coming right up after this one. If you want some non-horror body counts, please come back to the channel. I've got a lot planned for the year. So thank you so much again for watching, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.